so we're, we're looking today at Dada. It's a, one of the isms, you can call it Dadaism, uh, of 20th century art. And it's a little bit difficult to find. It's not a sort of a, a kind of precise group with members like the Futurist group was. It's more a sort of general tendency. It has various sort of characteristics. It's kind of, you could say, a lot of it is nihilistic, even anti-art. It has a kind of anti-bourgeois attitude, a sort of discontent with society as it existed, aiming at social change in some way. Anti-rational, you could say using chance and absurdity as strategies. It's definitely not a style. Uh, it's not definable in formalistic terms. It's a diversity of phenomenon under one label uh, without, that sort of, without a kind of manifesto and common aims in that, that sense. Perhaps that in the nature of something that's a bit anarchic in its approach, you know, it's not so easy to define. And partly the problem is because it happened in a, a variety of different centers, different cities in different parts of Europe. And each city had a slightly different flavor, even though sometimes people are moving from one city to another and carrying, carrying the virus with them, as it were. So uh, perhaps the first city where uh, one can see Dada as a kind of group phenomenon is Zurich in Switzerland. But um, you know, there are works which we think of as Dada works which were made before the time that the Zurich Dada got started. Maybe we could date it as a, a kind of tendency between 1916 to 1923. But for example, when we come to look at Duchamp, we'll see works he created before that date that we think of as his Dada works. So it's all complicated. Um, Berlin was one center. Uh, quite a politicized sort of flavor to Dada in Berlin. Artists like Gross and uh, Hartfield were associated with that. Cologne, where Max Ernst was involved, Hanover, Paris, and New York, as well as Zurich, were, were centers. Even the name, it's hard to pin down what does it mean. It has a sort of like a, a childish sort of sound to it. Mama, Dada, you know, baby, baby talk. In uh, Slavonic uh, languages, and uh, quite a number of uh, the important figures of Dada have that kind of linguistic background. It has a very positive association. A yes, yes, you know, a fir very affirmative. Um, here's a few sort of statements about Dada by people involved. Uh, André Breton, who was involved but later goes on to be the founder of Surrealism, a very closely related movement. Uh, he says, Cubism was a school of painting, Futurism a political movement, and Dada a state of mind. Hugo Ball says, Dada's intention was a gladi gladiatorial gesture, a public execution of false morality. Gabrielle Buffet, who uh, she says, Dada aspires to escape from everything that is common or ordinary or sensible. Dada does not recognize any tradition, any influence, or indeed any limits. Dada is a spontaneous product of life, a sort of cerebral mushroom which can appear and grow in every soil. Dada cannot be defined, it reveals itself. Well, the, the context of Dada is the First World War. You know, we've, come, we've talked about the war as uh, you know, a factor in, in relation to art in a number of ways when, when we're talking about futurism, when we're talking about German expressionism. A number of artists died in the war apart from anything else. Um, so, you know, the war for some people seemed to be the ultimate expression of the bankruptcy of the old society, the old kind of authoritarian society that had, you know, it capitalist society, put it another way, had shown that it leads to, uh, to, to this, you know, nationalism had, uh, and 
um, imperial competition is one explanation of the cause of the First World War, competing advanced capitalist economies, Germany, England, etc., or nationalist feeling that's so, so sort of tied to, to, to this sort of thing. Um, and it's war, but often important contributions to Dada were made in neutral territory. That's the, the important role of Zurich in Switzerland. And Zurich, uh, Switzerland, of course, is famously a sort of neutral country, was in the First World War already. Um, and not made in Switzerland by Swiss people, made in Switzerland by, uh, in Zurich, by emigres, you know, the, the people who come from other countries maybe to escape the war or to escape the kind of society that uh, they would have to live in there. Yeah, emigres are often sort of disaffected people. People, uh, you know, you, you know, the Russian Revolution. Key figures like Lenin. He was a, a, an emigre in Switzerland during the First World War. You know, so on the political front, often emigres are the people who who are ch going to change society. You know, the Ayatollah Khomeini, who ch created the the, the the Islamic Revolution in Iran. He he was there living as an emigre in Paris, you know, for a long time. You know, it's all, often the emigres are people who are kind of outside the society at home. Um, the whole absurdity of war, the bankruptcy of the old order. Tristan Zara, one of the important founders of Dada, he says the beginnings of Dada were not the beginnings of art, but of disgust. You know, so it's sort of typical of wartime reaction. Ultimately, rather transitory, yet with quite a strong legacy, as I, as I mentioned already, to surrealism, the immediately following art movement, but also to a lot of later art. You know, even today, an artist like Ai Weiwei, for example, in many ways, it's impossible to understand what he's doing without reference back to Duchamp. In fact, you know, sometimes he doesn't seem to have moved very far from what Duchamp did a hundred years before. Uh, but lots of legacy to to installation art, conceptual art of different kinds. It's a funny kind of art movement because it's a sort of anti-art movement. Well, I'd qualify that by saying that some people involved with Dada, what they did really, it, it is art, and you can it, at, at no point was it not art. But there's also an uh, anti-art side to it. Um, Zara, I just mentioned him, he suggests the aim of Dada is to humiliate art, to put it in a subordinate place in the supreme move, movement measured only in terms of life, you know, to replace art by life. Mm. <coughs> attempt to shock taste, existing taste. But something funny happens is that existing taste somehow manages over time to absorb Dada artistic production or anti-art production. And, you know, art becomes a, art's like a monster that gets more powerful no matter, you know, what it eats, you know. Um, you try and poison it and it, that makes it stronger. So uh, art today is, is different from what it was before Dada, but it's even if it's still art and not anti-art. Uh, sometimes we, we use the word recuperation to describe this process, how something that is um, a radical challenge can be absorbed by, by and commodified and so forth by the by the mainstream. Some uh, legacies of Dada, well, it, within Surrealism you see um, the kind of Dada absurdity, anti-rational quality and humor often coming through. And also the use of chance effects. Uh, there's generally a desire to kind of link art and life Um. <coughs> yeah, 
Yeah, in, in Zurich, one of the key things that uh, the Dada people did was to hold us, really, it's a, a sort of literary cabaret, a cabaret Voltaire, it's named after the famous rationalist philosopher. Uh, although, you know, absurdity and anti rationalism it was a great strategy. So some of their events were kind of theatrical events using noise music or you know poetry without without meaning deliberately provoking their audience you know rather than attempting to please them deliberately mystifying the audience um, that has its heritage to things like happenings and performance art Well, maybe let's look at some examples. I'm I'm starting with a couple of artists who are less um, artists that one less sort of stereotypically Dada artists, but I, you know, to show the range of what 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 is possible. I'm I'm starting with two German artists. We've we've just been talking about art in Germany in previous lectures, so that I'm sort of that. I'm putting them at the start, even though they're atypical of data, because it helps create a link with what we've talked about before. And the first artist would be Hartfield, and the <coughs> second artist would be Gross. Actually, they were George Gross, John Hartfield. They, they were friends. Um, both of them slightly anglicized the sp spelling of their name at a certain point, and that was a sort of reaction against, of disgust against the national German nationalism of the First World War. They were both against the war. Um, both of them were involved with the Berlin Dada. I, I, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to look at their work as a whole rather than talk about them as Dada artists. So uh, that's the same strategy I will use for the, the other artists I consider as well. I won't just consider the data phase of their, their work. So Hartfield, yeah, opposed the First World War. He was involved with the German Communist Party. Um, so very much on the political left. And all the way through his main means is photo collage, using photography, but not as a a photographer himself, he's not taking his own photos, he's always using other people's photos. So all of this gains permission from Cubist collage. Collage is such an influential strategy on artists who produce work that's very uncubist in its look. Um, but the idea of cutting things up and rearranging them um, is something which comes from there. Um, so this is the salvation they bring. Is the t title here? Um, so it's w war pa planes and their vapor trails, making a kind of skeletal hand. This is a typical kind of uh, strategy that he would use. His most famous image was made in 1932. Millions stand behind me. The meaning of the Hitler salute. There are, you know, maybe different versions pr pr produced, but um, you can see how often there are texts added because they would be reproduced in printed um, <coughs> context. This is, 1932 is just the year before Hitler came to power. 1933, he came to power, and the end, therefore, of it was the last, in the last free election of the Weimar Republic before authoritarian one-party rule began. Um, so Hitler was a populist. He, he's cla claiming, he's tr trying to come up with policies that are, you know, appealing to the, to the, to the, to the masses or claiming to be um, a mass party, they, they called themselves the National Socialists. They weren't socialists, but it kind of is like that sort of false appeal to, to uh, uh, claim to uh, mass support. Uh, and so th this is an image aimed 
not a, ran a randomly aimed attack at him, but it's a, an a image that wants to um, deliberately pierce one of the key, key claims that um, Hitler is making of mass support uh, uh, by a sort of pun. There are millions, you know, he's claiming there are millions of people standing behind him. And this image is saying, ah, yeah, there are millions behind you, okay, but it's the millions of Deutschmarks from uh, the anonymous uh, capitalist that is behind you. You know, that's actually where your support comes from. Uh, and Hitler had his own specific salute. His signs were very important for the Nazis, and you know, they're very good at propaganda and. and you know that their rallies were very orchestrated, very choreographed affairs. Uh, just the use of the symbols, like the the, the the swastika symbol or whatever, they were very good at marketing, if you want to put it that way. Uh, so Hitler had his own specific s salute that he used. That was uh, other people had their own that were, were meant to salute him in a different way, but he had his own particular salute. So that he. Th a gesture that had a particular meaning in Nazi culture is, is re given a new meaning. So the next time you see Hitler making his salute, you can imagine him sort of leaning back to grab some more money from his anonymous <laughs> supporters. So it, it, it's from a, a kind of left-wing position that this kind of image is uh, making its uh, attack on him, associating with an anonymous big business. Hitler as an agent of capitalism, uh, as opposed to be the supporter of the little man. Actually, he's a little man in relation to his big, big m supporters. So it's a quoting of Hitler's um, or Nazi social uh, Nazi propaganda imagery, and then recontextualizing or unmasking. It's very, very uh, influential uh, as a strategy, you know. Today, <laughs> you know, anything that happens politically in Hong Kong, for example, <laughs> netizens will have some image and they'll rework it or whatever, and, you know, Nang Chang Ying as this and that and the other, and whatever it is, whoever is, whoever is the current target, or any image will, you know, will, will, will be played around with. Uh, and instead of using scissors, now of course we can use Photoshop and other such digital manipulation tools. But basically it's all a strategy that goes back to Dada and to artists like Hartfield. In the Middle Ages, so in the Third Reich. So taking a, a, a stained glass Gothic church window, uh, showing an image of someone being broken on a wheel, tortured, uh, and the same image um, kind of mimicked with modern photography, taking the most well-known symbol of Nazism, the swastika, and giving it a new meaning. So every time you see it again, you, you think of it in association with torture, and breaking of human bodies. So it's got a specific job of work that it's trying to do. A pan-German, someone who's you know supporting the you know Germanic ideology overall of the bringing together all of the German-speaking world. You know, Austria was a separate country until Hitler brought made it part of Germany, and the invasions uh, into surrounding nations were often to originally to recover the territory that was German-speaking. So he's taken a, 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 you know, it's like a crime scene type photo and add, added it, the figure of a, in, in Nazi uniform. Word and image often coming together. All the fists have been clenched as one. It's a magazine cover, so again, words and images. Very close to something, you know, that was tried by a Russian artist, 
photo montage poster by Clusis. Uh, the idea of solidarity creating strength. George Gross now. Um, get him. Also associated with Berlin Dada, also a very, very much as a politicized leftist artist, very much against the First World War. His work, unlike Hart Hartfield's work, has a kind of stylistic homogeneity to it. Um, but with Gross, it's a different story. He's trying out very different styles. It's almost as if he, you know, he's having a debate with himself what would be the appropriate style for a leftist protest art, politicized art in a capitalist society, well, capitalists becoming fascist. You could say that fascism was a kind of type of um, mutation of, uh, you know, that can only happen within a capitalist society only did happen in capitalist society. So in this work, the pandemonium, we're seeing something that is um, really very, this is 1914, I should give a date, um, it's an ink drawing. It, it's very much influenced by the stylistic vocabulary of futurism. So we're seeing him using kind of modernist strategies you know, the, the interpenetration of forms, that's very much futurist, you know, the city life concerns, although it's much more politicized, I would say, you know, people are very angry. It's, it's not, there's not a clear target of what it's um, attacking, but generally it's a, a sense of discontent mm -hmm. uh, about modernity. <laughs> Uh, it is to be something we get from it, the sort of topsy-turvy quality that comes from futurist vocabulary, but um, yeah, gives, <coughs> given a particular uh, association here. But he, he never s seems to be completely happy with, with, with just one approach, so he's, uh, he tries out different things over time. And he's perhaps most well known for a sort of caricature style not really so influenced by modernism, I would say, as the pandemonium image. This is um, at five o'clock in the morning. <coughs> so it just draws a, a line. Above the line, the workers have got up, they're on their way to work at 5 a.m. The factories are still already started but the the rich have not gone to bed yet because it's still the evening before for them and you know the themes of drunkenness and debauchery prostitution this is he, he he produces a pretty comprehensive damning portrait of Weimar Republic society the society in the period before um, uh, the rise of Hitler. Of course, that's partly why Hitler was able to rise, because there was a sense of this is a failed society. You have one um, coalition government after another, and democracy seeming not quite to be able to succeed. You know. In the wake of the uh, Wall Street crash, you have the Great Depression, capitalism seeming not to be working. <coughs> vast disparities of wealth. So it, it's, it's not just sort of a sort of generalized discontent, it's a class-based, you know, Marxist di diagnosis of it, if you like, with the aim to try and energize you towards, you know, changing this situation. Art as a tool art as a hammer rather than as a mirror.
lot of his work is graphic work, <coughs> you know, suitable for reproduction. Working through mass reproduced images, of course, that has certain advantages for a politicized art anyway, because you know, you if you're making some handmade object that costs a lot of money and only a ri one rich person can buy that unique object, then how is that going to have much political impact? Oh, okay, if it ended up in a museum, you know, like some of the politicized work from the 1990s Chinese artists that we can see in the SIG collection at Artistry, I think today might be the last day, um, you know, that, that okay, meets, meets a, a, ride, a, a wider public. But uh, for the most part, if, you, if reproduction is a is a better way to, to to ensure that you immediately reach a wider public. So what we have here is fit for active service. This is like a military doctor, look, you know, deciding who who can be called up for the army, and even a, a rotting skeleton uh, is declared fit for service. You know. So attacks the military. He attacks. Uh, he got into trouble for attacking the church at one point. And attacks different kind of figures in society. The communists are dying, and the foreign exchange rates are going up. So military repression is good for business, or something like that. There was a communist uprising at the end of the First World War that uh, didn't get that far, but you know, uh, this is all recent history for, for Germany. So the political context is very different if you're in Zurich to if, if you're in Berlin. Well, here's to show some of his painting. Metropolis. This would be going back now to an example. This is from 1917, an example of something that's closer to that kind of futurist style. But then something like this is again, it's a kind of modernist style, but not futurism. In fact, it's influenced by an artist we haven't looked at in his own right yet. That's Di Chirico, the Italian artist. The st strange um, mannequin-like figures he produces, and the sort of empty, haunting s cityscapes in his work. But here, you know, repurpose for a very different goal—a political kind of art. So we're we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, bourgeois pillars of society, you know, the, 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 the people in suits and ties and, well, even military veterans, well, medal-wearing people, these are, are treated as empty-headed, literally empty-headed um, nationalists, you know, flag wavers. Uh, well, yeah, the war and all the the... the, the maiming and killing that uh, was associated with it is not far far behind you at this point. Um, one, two, three, hooray, you know, sort of uh, s slogans and uh, cheering positivity, but it's all coming from empty nowhere. It's uh, actually s something like a mach machine, it's sort of kind of like a kind of collage treatment uh, added in. Well, it's a modern means for a political art. Does, does it work? He's trying lots of different approaches. Pillars of society. Well, priests, uh, mil military associations. It's a Nazi symbol. The Nazi party was around a lot before they gain power. This is a, a chamber pot, something for 
urinating into overnight when you can't get to a proper toilet. We don't see them around very much anymore, but uh, anyway, he's wearing it as a hat. Inside this head is just a, a pile of steaming excrement. That's a comment on the kind of thoughts going through his brain. So visual equivalent to, uh, I mean painting equivalent to those uh, car uh, graphic cartoons that I was showing earlier. But sometimes then he'll go to a well, it's more like a kind of realist style in a way. Okay, there's still some distortion, but it's more than that kind of generalized caricatural treatment. So this is what I mean by him sort of trying out different approaches. You know, in this sort of period of, we're talking about last time, of new objectivity as a term used to describe art in the interwar period where the expressionistic solution seemed to not quite be the right one anymore. Um, George Gross has some kind of dialogue with that, you could say. It's not so different from the George Dix portrait we were looking at last, last time. This is his portrait of the poet Max Hermann Nice. Now, jumping to Paris, uh, Duchamp, who I suppose to most people is the most famous name associated with Dada. Sometimes we, we think of Dada in terms of his work and perhaps forget the diversity of other forms that it can take. I'm looking not at a Dada work here, of course, so I'm looking at the kind of work he produced prior to his Dada phase, so this is his nude descending a staircase, the most famous of the works he produced in his Cubist phase, 1912. Of the French Cubists, he's the one most interested in trying to represent motion, because we saw how the Italian futurists were very interested in representing motion. They took the fragmentation that was there in the Cubist vocabulary uh, but instead of looking at the same static object from different shifting viewpoints, mobility of the spectator, they used it to represent a mo a mobility of the object itself. Uh, and <coughs> Duchamp does something similar, but without that interest in modernity and city life that we see there in futurism. It's much more uh, a matter uh, just the movement it itself. His whole approach um, is really a very um, cerebral one. Uh, he's not so interested in the, um, you know, the painterly side of painting, the actual manipulation of, of pigment, of the physical touch and texture and the sensuous or material side of painting. It's always a, a more um, cerebral approach, as I say. He, he talks about having a desire to put painting once again at the service of the mind. I was endeavouring to establish myself as far as possible from pleasing and attractive physical paintings. The more sensual appeal a pr painting provided, the more animal it became the more highly it was regarded. So this very, um, you know, the, the very rational approach, a cerebral intellectual approach. Uh, he was also a big chess player, you know, a really very good chess player. Um, it, it's something which will lead him eventually to giving up painting altogether in his Dada phase. Um, yeah, you can see the influence of photography of motion. I, I showed you when we were looking at futurism, the pho pho photography of motion by Mary, M-A-R-E-Y. There's also Muybridge, of course, but Mary, I think, is closest to, you know, this little dot-like 
forms which kind of mimic the effect that you that, that Mary's photography produced where you have a multiple exposure of a figure and maybe have, there are little torches on the attached to the body to help to mark the the the, the motion the figure here seems to have come <coughs> down in a zigzag fashion a, a, a sort of stairs that, that turns an angle or something like that it's a nude that's something that makes it a little bit different from the Italian futurists, they're not interested in the nude because they associate that, the nude with tradition and they're very anti-tradition which they feel a particular weight of in, in Italy Bride. Similar kind of subject in a way, but somehow become more. The same, I mean, same same color scheme. The, the the cubist kind of narrowing of tonality to focus <coughs> on form. <coughs> The, the, the female body seems to be the, the subject matter, but in a very, very stylized way, almost become like a machine uh, and, uh, and a sort of dissecting view rather than a surface view, as if we're sort of seeing a view of internal organs, but almost treated like a piece of machinery. And then the Dada works, such as the Fountain of 1917. It's just a urinal, a slightly kind of taboo or sh shocking object, you could say. And just nothing much changed in it. It's been signed to make it a work of art, but there's a distancing involved there because it's not signed by Duchamp, it's signed by R. Mutt, some made-up artist's name. So, you know, the, it's the artists themselves that are being kind of deconstructed here. The whole notion that you can produce something by, uh, as art by putting it in an art gallery and signing it. Sign, wh where is it? It, it? It's a it's a sort of philosophical gesture about how what is art. You know, that's a very twentieth century concern. How you know we start to having been making art for many, many hundreds of years. Finally, we start to worry. Well what actually is art, you know, let's, let's think about it for a moment, that's a really, really much a 20th century worry. It's perhaps surprising that we, we never got too worried about defining what art is in previous centuries, but in the 20th century we did. Uh, so just as philosophers might, might have thought about how do you define what is art, uh, so artists themselves were involved in it, and Duchamp is in the foreground of all this. He's putting the, the category under erasure in a way, uh, by deliberately taking a non-art object and treating it as art with very minimal changes. So it raises the question, is it just the context that makes it art? If you put it in an art gallery, that's what he did. If you sign it, as a and sign and date it as an artist, does that make it art? The only other change, I think, is that, well, it's no longer a functional object, uh, but it's been changed in its orientation. It's all sitting up. It, um, people have sometimes said it looks a little bit like a sort of Buddha image. So this is uh, very much fits in Dada in terms of a, a slightly kind of shock quality, a urinal in the, um, you know, the, the hallowed halls of art. That's a little bit unusual for his 
ready-made works. That's the, the, the term used to describe them. Um, most of them are not sort of sh intrinsically shocking ob objects. It's a linking of art and life. That's very much a, a, a Dada thing, taking everyday life into the realm of art. Absurdity of, of, of doing something like this, the humor of doing something like this. Ironic kind of humor, very intellectual kind of humor. So what makes art art? You know, in the 20th century, starting off from objects like this, you have plenty of cases where art has not been fabricated by the artists themselves. Uh, uh, you know, minimalist artists like uh, Judd or Andre. Um, Judd would order works of art down the phone from the fabricators, things like that. You know, uh, some artists would. Um, the artwork is a set of instructions and then you can actualize those instructions. It doesn't matter who does it, you just follow the instructions and then that is the work of art. Duchamp says, um, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain or not has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object. So this, is, this, is a, this artist's statement is a, itself a kind of ironic statement, as if he believed that there was a Mr. Mutt who made it and he's trying to defend Mr. Mutt's uh, artistic effort. In a way, this is again going back to collage. You know, you can't imagine this without collage and its taking of everyday objects and putting them in an artistic context. It could be a, a fragment of a piece of newspaper or something like that to represent a newspaper in a Picasso Cubist collage. Uh, it's only one more step from that to take a urinal and put it in an art gallery. And, Inscriptions and titles become quite important with Duchamp. Um, they're not just little labels to identify, they add some extra dimension, sometimes a, a kind of verbal pun. They make the work less um, optical in its address and more, you know, intellectual perhaps, more cerebral. There's a big legacy to surrealist art of these ready-mades of Duchamp that, and the equivalents that other uh, surrealist artists produce. A, a legacy to surrealism. The surrealist artists also like to make um, ob, you know, works of art that are composed of objects. Their concern is with the real world, not with the world of fantasy or, or, or something. Art is not an escape from the real world for them. So confusing the categories of art and, and life, you know, the two can come together by moving an object from one to the other. Maybe you break down those categories, at least you make us more aware of those categories. Just an example of a later artist influenced by Duchamp, this is Sherry Levine, and she produces what one out of very valuable material, so it, it's a, therefore it is a kind of art object. <laughs> Jeff Koons uh, does something similar, you know, producing um, a, ch a child's balloon dog as a, a you know, out of very uh, high end crafted materials. Well, another of Duchamp's most famous ready-mades. And again, it, it's the, in the category of ready-mades uh, aided. You know, it's not a pure object. It's an object with some addition to it. Again, the addition is a verbal one. 
L H O O Q. It's just a reproduction of the Mona Lisa, but with those letters added on. And if you read that in French, in terms of the, the names of those letters in French, it sounds a bit like a phrase in French, she's got the hot, something like that. She, she's turned on or something, she's sexually aroused, that would be the implication. So it's slightly rude, you know, taking a, an artwork uh, that is a kind of iconic of art itself, not just uh, Leonardo, and then it big, and then well, I suppose it's a, a sort of expan it's a sort of explanation of the uh, the famous question about the Mona Lisa is why is she smiling? And she's got this enigmatic smile. So maybe this is an explanation. She's smiling because she's uh, sexually aroused or something like that. That's an, an implication. Of course, the other thing is like a, a graffiti-like additions to uh, make the, 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 the face masculine as well as feminine, to, to, to try to make gender ambiguous. She's one of the most famous artistic representations of femininity, uh, but here she's, her gender is, is made ambiguous. But that's the sort of thing people always love to do on posters, you know, draw a little moustache on a poster and things like that. So it's a mimicking of, of kind of graffiti-like uh, activities. The Mona Lisa was, was stolen. That was the beginning of its kind of modern fame. So it became a kind of, that's where it started to become famous as an art, artwork that stands in for art itself. So he's playing with that, with that fame, as much as anything else. It's the, how mass reproduction can give power to an image. So he's play, he's engaging with the reproduction. Of course, he could never do something like this to the to the original itself. Um, are there yeah. Any, like earlier ones that like use the similar strategies? Er, earlier, the earlier um, the, like by him. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, there's lots of artists that have made reference to earlier artists' works uh, and played around with those references in different ways, like Goya's references to Velasquez or something like that. But that's not it's not quite the the same with this also. So it's really at the beginning of something. It's, it's, it's only when you get to the era of mass reproduced images that you can imagine images <coughs> having that kind of omnipresence and therefore the attempt to, uh, to, to, to yeah. deconstruct that somehow. Um, well, this, this is what it's like if you go today to see the Mona Lisa. You have to work your way through the, the crowds who have gathered around it. So now, now the <coughs> phenomenon is even more powerful, mm -hmm. uh, the fame of an object that it, it gained through its reproductions. Uh, of course, many artists since have, have played with it. This is Andy Warhol. <coughs> and by re mass reproducing Mona Lisa many times, um, within the same image, different colors. He's uh, referring to it, its power as having grown through reproduction, I suppose. Repetition is, is laid bare. Yeah, and one other artist who's really in the same sort of time period uh, uh, as Dada and Duchamp is playing around with Mona Lisa is Malievich. So this could be an answer to your question. You say he's sort of done it around about the same time, taken a reproduction of Mona Lisa. He's cancelled it, 
torn it you know he's also kind of damaged damaged it in a way like in the same way as graffiti over it would damage it and then incorporated it in some larger thing which is his thing it, again it's, it's cubist color strategy that allows that manipulating other images This is Rauschenberg, Pneumonia Lisa. So it's like a new Mona Lisa, or pneumonia is like an <laughs> Ill illness. So, uh, well, he's particularly sort of playing around with the chest area. So that sort of pneumonia is associated with lungs or whatever. Um, wow, well, you're a Chinese character. Yeah, I don't know. Wait, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's taking her into a cross cultural environment. <laughs> oh, and the element of sort of Punning involved, um, you know, it's taken up by other later artists. Since we're looking at later artists' work, this is Bruce Nauman from Hand to Mouth, 1967. Well, you know, if you're if you're if you're very poor, you don't have any savings. You can be said to be living from hand to mouth, and this is literally a kind of a cast of a figure from their hand to their mouth. Back to Duchamp. This is his bottle rack from 1914. So this is the first. Uh, the El Alashaoku is is uh, 1919. So I'm jumping around a bit. This is the 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 first pure ready-made. You could say there's. I'm going to show you the bicycle wheel, which is earlier. That's 1913. But that is actually two things put together. And the ones we've looked at already, the the, the fountain and and Alasho, who have both involved some kind of additions to the ready-made objects that's used. But this is just one thing recontextualized in an art context. And and this is more typical of his ready-made uh, in in that it, it it's not something intrinsically shocking or anything. It's just it's just an everyday object, a rack. You, you know, if you you've just been doing your wash washing, and uh, you you wash some bottles, you put the bottles onto this rack to dry. Um, so it's just an everyday everyday object of no special significance, no, it's not valuable or, or particularly, you know, characterful in any way. Duchamp says this about his ready maids. a point that I want to very much to establish is that the choice of these ready maids was never dictated by aesthetic delectation. The choice was based on a reaction of visual indifference with at the same time a total absence of good or bad taste in fact a complete anesthesia he's saying I didn't choose these objects because I thought they were somehow beautiful and I wanted to draw attention to them and I wasn't attacking them either it wasn't that I hated them or thought they were terrible or had some negative association it's just kind of indifferent I didn't care you know trying to get away from the whole aesthetic feeling. But this is all very Dada. Yet, you know, art has been able to take back the, these objects. So people have looked at something like this and said, well, it's actually it's a very interesting kind of shape in a way. You know, it's kind of very pleasing just as a, as a shape. Um, well, uh, in, in, certainly in a more general uh, sense uh, this kind of gesture has influenced art I think oh well yeah, yeah 
now maybe we can make art where we don't have a, a sculpture where we don't have a base to it we just the sculpture just sits directly onto the onto the, the surface the artist hasn't created the base here the musicological uh, s setting they created a base but the base is, is that belongs to the museum it doesn't belong to to the work uh, so that's very influential on certain uh, sculptures. Um, just making a sculpture that's not about a human image, that's already something kind of new and could be quite inspiring for, for, for sculptures. You can make a kind of abstract sculpture, it doesn't refer to the human form. Or uh, make using a pierced form. Oh yeah, maybe we can make sculptures where there's space inside the sculpture that's visible. You know, it's not it doesn't have to be a closed form. It could be an open form. Lots of sculptors will find all that kind of idea very interesting. There's a lot of ways you could go from this as an artist without taking up the any of the anti-art dimensions of, of Duchamp. And you say, oh, well, yeah, we can use these new materials. You know, we don't have to use traditional sculptural uh, materials like bronze and, and marble. Maybe we can just use everyday metals that we use for everyday objects, too. So there's that possibility of taking back. Duchamp says, uh, you know, he felt he had to ration himself with the ready-made. He said, I, I realized very soon the danger of repeating indiscriminately this form of expression, that is the, the ready-made. I decided to limit the production of ready-mades to a small number yearly. I was aware at this time that for the spectator, even more than for the artist, art is a habit-forming drug and I wanted to protect my ready-mades against such a contamination. Sometimes these early ready-mades would get lost and destroyed you know and he would just sort of remake them later which also kind of works against the idea of the uniqueness of the art object it is partly sort of a, a, a attacking the kind of uh, the importance of the of the artist as, as, as something special I was trying to kill the artist as a god he says I feel that I'm against the reverence towards the artist the world has. And this is for, remember, it's a sort of idea picked up by Andy Warhol by calling his studio a factory. You know, it's just we just make make stuff. You know, we're not there's nothing special about it. Uh, other later artists who've you know been inspired by this sort of thing, just to give another example painted bronze 1960 by Jasper John in his case it's not you know it's actually a bronze sculpture so it's us he's using a sculptural material and he made it him himself cast it I suppose to get these from and then you know painted it but he's made it look like an actual actual object as if it were already made but it's not so he's you know, add another level of play to it but even abstract sculpture like this by Anthony Carra early one morning for 1962 it's, it's very hard to imagine these kind of open forms in sculpture and uh, without the, the sort of play that Duchamp had done I mean he's a very un-Duchampian kind of artist that's why I'm using him as an example but even he it'd be hard to imagine without the intervention that Duchamp made to sculpture back to Duchamp, the bicycle wheel. So this is 1913, this is probably the earliest of these kind of things that he produced, although you know, probably what we're looking at was remade in 1964. Again, it could be influential within sculpture itself, even if it, one takes it as an anti-art gesture, art can make use of it, because it's a, a beginning point of kinetic sculpture. You wouldn't be allowed to in a museum now, but in, in theory you could play with it and make it move. You know, it's a sculpture with moving parts. This is really a, a modern idea. So 
so just about a hundred years after Duchamp displayed a bicycle wheel you know you get these works by Ai Weiwei where he includes lots of bicycle frames to make it into a, an artwork a hundred years later but actually how much distance have we traveled in a way it's not that that far this is one where it's very much um, visual verbal well, sorry the slide's not that clear but the title is inscribed on the artwork itself Fresh Widow so it's a pun in English he actually went to New York during the um, First World War but, you know, to escape the war from Paris took uh, made New York another city where Dada thrived. He is later back in France, but also was back in New York late in his life, and that's why artists like Jasper Johns, New York-based artists, were influenced by him. So a pun in English is um, explicable in in that way. Um, so a fresh, fresh wid. It's a pun between fresh widow, the title, and. French window. A French window is a door that <coughs> opens out like this. But this door you can't see through the windows. They're all painted black, uh, like a, a sort of color of mourning associated with a fresh widow. But fresh widow itself could have a double meaning. A fresh widow is someone who's freshly widowed, but uh, also uh, stereotypically widows are thought to be sort of sexually deprived and therefore interested in in, in sex and and uh, uh, you know she might get fresh meaning she's she's should get she wants to get fresh with you she wants to get uh, make a sexual approach to you so there's all these sort of p punning associations uh, are playing around with copyright you know, it's because it's it's ready-made objects so it's a bit of a joke to talk about copywriting, writing your copyright on the op art object itself, like like people would copyright symbols at the front of books. It's unusual to put it on an artwork. Copyright by Rose Selavi. So that's a, a kind of female alter ego that he uh, adopts at certain points. So he's using it here. Again, it's sort of distancing himself from the artist's role, like putting our mutt on the fountain here, it's Rose Selavy, the S S E L A V Y, but it, it, it it's in French it sounds like that's life, c'est la vie, you know, so sometimes a, a little bit more poetic in a way. Um, why not sneeze, Rose Selavy? This is the title here. Strange kind of question as a title. Um, it's a bird cage with the little cubes of marble, which is an artistic material, but here it used to represent like sugar cubes, and then there's a thermometer. But in this case, unlike the others, it, it, there's a strange sort of sense of poetry to it, you know, putting these uh, incompatible objects together, it starts to be more like a surrealist object where the, a strange poetry starts to spark from unusual juxtapositions. <coughs> Ball of twine. Um, well, here um, we're starting to See, we're seeing a sort of beginning of sound art, if you like, um, taking um, an object that has something hidden inside it. You know, the art is now not just for the eyes. There's something there that we can't, the eye can't see. hidden in the middle of this ball of twine between two metal plates that are held tightly together there is an object you could rattle it and you can hear that object but we don't know what that object is and supposedly Duchamp himself doesn't know because he got someone else to put it in for him 
so attacking vision, if you, if you like, making artwork that vision is insufficient to to deal with. That's really rather unusual, uh, since artists, you know, normally vision can exhaust visual art. This is his most ambitious work, um, and it sort of brings together a lot of things that were in earlier works. The bride stripped bare by her bachelors, even, or sometimes just called the large glass. He began it around 1915, or the images that go into it. Um, and worked on it till 1923, off and on, but then left it unfinished. Didn't didn't take it any further. Made of unusual materials, glass, dust and varnish, and as well as some paint. There's one point where he talks about backgrounds in painting. He says in painting images, um, the question of painting in a background is degrading for a painter. The thing you want to paint is not the background. Uh, so in this case, he's got rid of that problem because there is no background. It's all just glass. So you know, the background is borrowed from whatever happens to be in the environment. You just have the forms. And you can view it from both sides, of course. So there's a kind of reversal of possibilities, as well as the random chance element of what, what the background will be. Chance intervened in another way when the glass broke when it was being stored, and he decided to kind of accept that. Another chance thing he accepted was some dust that gathered on the surface while it was being stored. and. Um, he just sort of varnished the, to, the dust to, to keep it in place. So use of char chance <coughs> elements. There are two zones within the image. The top zone is a sort of female zone and the bottom zone is a, a sort of male zone. These forms here, uh, he calls them the malic molds. They're sort of male forms stylized representation of clothing of different male occupations. Um, and here's the forms, the female, main female form is taken from that painting, The Bride. Each image has its own strange source. This is a chocolate grinding machine grinding up the, the cocoa beans, I suppose. This is where the dust is here. These shapes were cloths that were moving in a breeze and then photographs were taken of them and then that, that creates these forms. So the, the it's deliberately mystificatory. It's not something you quite work out what's going on, but there is the sort of male and female areas, and it's a sense about a very ironic take on male-female relationships because the the two parts can't quite communicate with it with with each other. Both the male and female. Um, elements are represented almost sort of mechanically. There's a mechanical deconstructive metaphor about uh, hu human life and human sexuality, perhaps. So a lot of these images, like the chocolate grinder, appear in separate works that he'd already made. 
and then he's bringing them all together. He also produced a kind of whole box full of m uh, explanatory notes and extra materials, images that actually makes it even more complicated and difficult to understand. So it's deliberately a sort of uh, mystificatory, ob obscure in a way. It's a sort of parody, perhaps, of existing traditional iconography in, in art. In the latter years of his life, he sort of more or less abandoned art, although he did he did have a sort of secret work that he was working on, the Eton Donne, uh, which is a kind of a room, and you can just look through that room, and s you can only view from that one viewpoint, and you see certain things inside. Worked on secretly for that from 1946 to 1966. But he, he seemed to have given up art. That's another kind of anti-art gesture. He did one or two installations at the opening of exhibitions. Again, it's a really a starting point for a whole genre, the genre of installation art. This is the installation at the International Exhibition of Surrealism, 1938. 1,200 bags of coal. There's a, a kind of brazier such as would be used to burn coal. And this is installation 1942 for the first papers of Surrealism exhibition. He just took some string and unrolled, unraveled it through the space, connecting up the uh, different parts of the of the, the of the space. And they're making you aware of the space itself, making you aware of the installation that the paintings were were in. Okay, let, let's have a break there a little bit late, but uh, I wanted to finish <coughs> looking at Duchamp. <coughs> Just sorry to show you an example of a. I forgot I had a comparative slide here. This is a Walter de Maria's Earth Room. Just an example of early um, installation art that is, you know, you, it's hard to imagine without what Duchamp did. Just filling a room full of earth, and it's in one specific place in New, in New York for many, many, many years. I don't even know if it's still there now. <coughs> 